My name is Bob Parsons. I'm a professor here in the School of Engineering. I also serve as Director of Facilities and Special Projects for the school. And this is a very special project for the school. It has the Career Accelerator Lecture, initiative of the school, the Engineering Advisory Board. Came up with this idea a couple of years ago, and it, it's been a big success where some of our alumni that have gone on to have successful career, very successful careers, distinguished alumni, uh, have come back, offered their time to come back and share with you some of the experiences that they've had and the wisdom that they have gained through that process to help you get a better start, an accelerated start on your career as you leave KU and go forward. Um, and we're very happy today to have Katherine Schultz with us, a 2003 graduate. Um, Katie Schultz is a 2003 civil engineering graduate from KU and is currently the Vice President of Talent Development and Management at Black & Beach, a global engineering and construction company. Uh, for many of you are already familiar with Black & Beach. Katie's engineering background and experience with both project and program management for critical infrastructure projects informs her approach to leadership development, upskilling for future project needs and talent strategies to build a robust and diverse leadership pipeline. In addition to numerous engineering projects, Katie's also led the development of a company-wide learning platform, experiential learning programs, and role-based development approaches. With a passion for supporting and growing talent across the engineering and construction industry, she frequently speaks at professional events, universities, and local schools on the important work of solving the talent challenges of the future. She was a co-founder of the Black and Beach Women's Network and serves on the board of Reach Out and Read Kansas City. She led the construction of and continues to lead the ongoing operation of a community library in and after Mexico, an impoverished community at the U.S.-Mexico border. In addition to her KU bachelor's degree, she also has a master's in transformational leadership from Nazarene Theological Seminary. A perfect person to come and talk about <laughs> accelerating your career and, and getting a good start as you leave KU. So, before I invite her over here, uh, I'll just say that uh, the rules are wrote for how this is going to work. Uh, she's going to come over and make a presentation. We would ask that you hold your questions until the end, and then we'll have a series of uh, uh, question and answer time. We also have some gifts for those of you brave enough to ask a question. We want this to be a fun time. This is a, this is a celebration of people who have left KU and had distinguished careers that have come back and spending some time with us who want it to be fun. We've got some gifts as well. We expect to be done somewhere around 5 o'clock, but you're invited to you know, stay and ask questions, I assume. Yeah. And uh, um, that's kind of how it will go. So with that, I'll turn it over Perfect. to you. Perfect. Thank you. It is so fun to be here. Like, so fun. I'm very, very excited about this. All right. So my dad is a professor here. You guys might know my dad. He teaches electrical engineering. And so I was born a Jayhawk. I was, I was born on, like, at Lawrence Memorial while my dad was getting his PhD. And um, so I was reflecting as I was prepping for this, besides just being excited to be back on campus, I was reflecting on these types of lectures that they had when I graduated 20 years ago uh, this year. 20 years ago, my husband and I were getting ready to graduate KU and get married. But before we did, the architecture school was offering something similar to this. So we went over to Wesco one night for a lecture on architecture careers. That was what he was studying. I was graduating with a civil engineering degree. And as we walked in um, to lecture, this like very amazing, flamboyant, very famous architect walked in with his black cape. And he stood in front of us and he said, if you are married, get a divorce. If you have a girlfriend, break up with her. You will not have time for that in this career. And we, like, we left so dejected. So I just want to say, I will not let you leave dejected. I only intend to make you feel happy and um, excited about the career in front of you through this conversation, because that was formative in a not helpful way. The other thing I want to do just to set the stage for our conversation is to tell you that I don't have the right answer. I have so many professionals at Black & Beach come to me and say, like, what should I do? I cannot tell you that. I can share my journey. I can tell you what I've observed from our professionals at Black & Beach and observed about the engineering industry, but there actually isn't a right answer. So I have four children. One of them's 18. She's about to graduate high school. And I have this thing. I say that there's a thousand ways to live a good life. So don't think that you're going to make a wrong choice. You're going to make a choice, hopefully, in service to a path that you can be really proud of at the end of the day. Um, but I'm not going to be able to offer you the right answer for where you need to go. The other thing I wanted to share, I'm going to bring a bunch of models to bear. Um, I have a couple of books I'll send you with that have some of these models in them. And if I took it from a book, I'll be sure to tell you that so you can write that down. 
Um, but I wish someone would have told me this piece a long time ago when I was in your seat. So again, I'm thinking back to that night we walked over and sat in that lecture hall and we left really kind of sad and bummed and thinking, oh my gosh, we might have just made a huge mistake in, in the path we're heading down. And I'm trying to give you guys the tools I hope will be useful. So one of the tools I want you to think about is you can change the headings on this. That's a bit loose. But essentially, what I want you to pay attention to is two circles on here, the black circle and the bright red circle. I think it's really important that we have balance in life, but that doesn't mean that we've exceeded every piece of this spider web. All that means is that probably you need two things that you're really focused on with the big red circle. Most of my life since I left KU has been on family. We got married and we had babies right away. I have four kids. So family has always been where my spider web is exceeding the red circle and my career. Those have really been the two places that I've really put a lot of thought and effort. Um, the other thing you don't want to do is go beyond the black circle. So make sure you're taking care of your health. Make sure that you're taking care of other pieces of who you are, but you cannot exceed the red on everything. You just can't. If you meet someone who says, I'm super burnt out, it's because they think they're trying to strive for more than's possible. So pick two or three that you're going to push outside that red boundary and say, I put a lot of my time into these and acknowledge I can't put it into everything. Um, and that shifts over life. Uh, I watch my kiddo who's getting ready to graduate and friends is huge for her right now. And I love that. Um, and recreation is pretty big right now as well. But in time, you're going to have to just pick a few. So you can make your circle have the headings you want and what matters to you. But just know you can't do it all at any one time. OK, so I talk really fast. I'm so sorry, but we're going to get through a lot of content. Um, I left KU and went to work for a small company called Water's Edge Aquatic Design. I think Cole, whose dad owns that, is in school right now, but he can't be here tonight. Um, Water's Edge was an awesome experience. Water's Edge designs municipal water parks. So you, you're, the engineering practice I'm doing at that stage of my life is mostly um, water design. Some We usually um, subbed out our structural um, site layouts. Um, a little bit of, um, we did a lot of like, I did a lot of sizing of pumps and construction site visits. So the nice thing about being at a small firm, Water's Edge had about 10 people when I was there, is I got to see exposure to all the components of a project. So this is some of the things to think about if you're thinking about, do I go to big firm, small firm? Small firm, exposure to lots of parts of a project. That's awesome. You get to meet clients right away, like literally on day one, they took me to a job site and I got to meet with a client. You get to know, be known by leadership, like, the team is only 10 of us. I'm sitting in leadership meetings. Um, you're also going to probably be called a PM. So I was at Water's Edge as an engineer. And by the time I left there four years later, I was already a PM. And you're going to get really specialized knowledge on a very niche topic, most likely, if you're at a really small firm. The cons are you're not going to be able to grow up into some senior vice president of da 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 da. OK, that's just not going to be. At a 10-person firm, you only can go up so high. The complexity and scale is probably going to be limited by the size of the firm. Um, if you become a specialty specialist on municipal water parks, in 10, 15 years, you've got to think about what am I, where could I take my career from there if I have this very niche specialization. And if you're a PM at a place like a small firm and you come to a place like, water Z, or like Black and Beach, which is where I went after that, it doesn't mean the same thing. It's not to diminish what it is to be a PM at a small firm. It's just not. It's apples and oranges. So just be mindful as you leave this place and you have a friend who goes to a small firm and you go to a big firm, and in three years, they're putting it on LinkedIn that they're a project manager. And you're like, man, I'm not getting the same growth. You are. It's just different. You're not going to get the same title, but you're getting good growth. So after four years, I went to Black & Beach. So Water's Edge, 10 people. Black & Beach, 10,000 people. Water's Edge based out of Lenexa. It's the only office. Black, Black & Beach is all over the globe. Black & Beach does about, this last year, we, we went past the $4 billion mark on revenue. So a um, lot of revenue, lots of projects, specializing mostly in Water, so again, with municipalities, similar to what I would have had at, at Water's Edge. Power, so with major utility clients. Um, and telecommunications, so at the time, like Sprint, uh, AT&T, et cetera. OK, pros of working for a big firm. You're going to get to work on hugely complex projects that you can be really proud of that take years and years, and some, I mean, sometimes 10 years to, to execute. Now, you're going to be one small part of a huge project. At Water's Edge, there was just like two of us that worked on these projects. So you feel a different ownership in it. Um, lots of opportunity for upward mobility. So you can grow to being a CEO of a 10, you know, billion company if that's what you aspire to. You're going to have access to amazing experts. The thing at a company like Black & Beach, not to push Black & Beach too hard, because I know there's other great companies in town, but there are people who've spent their entire lives getting deep expertise on subjects that you're going to have access to. You're going to get formalized development. So I've been sent to India to sit through leadership development training as part of Black & Beach. Water's Edge just wouldn't have had the capability to do that. Um, and places like Black & Beach, Burns and Max the same, employee ownership means that every year I'm earning stock, so the more 
this Black & Veatch stock, the better Black & Veatch does, the better my retirement is. So those are some pros for um, small firms. Not all, small, not all large firms are employee-owned, but Black & Veatch is. Cons for a large firm. You are only going to have a very small part in very large projects. You're going to feel super, super, super siloed. So when I was at Water's Edge, I might be writing a proposal, going to visit with a client, doing a site visit, doing some design, reviewing shop drawings, all within like 24 hours. At a place like Black & Veatch, you're going to review shop drawings for like two years. <laughs> And that's your job. And then you're going to get promoted to do something more. So it is a little bit different in um, kind of the scale of how you grow, but that's because you're getting deeper knowledge in that, in that because these projects are more complex. You're probably not going to meet a client right out of the gate the way I got to at a small firm. We're going to wait until you have a little bit more tenure because, again, these projects are more complex. You will feel like a, a, a cog in a massive wheel, especially at first in your career when you're earlier um, just graduated. And because it is so big, it can be hard to find your community. Like when I was at Water's Edge, it was just 10 of us. We're like a small family. A place like Black & Veatch, you can easily feel like, oh my gosh, like who are my people? Okay, so I'm just being candid on pros and cons. They all have good things, they all have bad things. 10,000 ways to live a good life, okay? So I'm not telling you which one to pick. There's just different things to think about. Okay, I'm gonna be really honest about my story about when I left, I actually debated like, how honest should I be about what happens when I leave, Black, or leave KU? So I'm going to tell the story about what happens when I leave KU, and I'm going to couch it in telling you I graduated top of my class. I'm not saying that to brag. I'm saying that because I don't want you to think, well, of course you didn't come out of the gate swinging because you're not very smart. I was smart. I just didn't find my way. So first day at Water's Edge, they take me into a pump room. We go to a site. It's a, a local pool, community pool. And we're standing in the pump room, and they were telling me about the valves and the da 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 And I'm thinking, oh, shoot. <laughs> I made a huge mistake. This is not interesting at all. Like, oh, no, 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 no. What am I going to do? We just got married. We have bills. I, blah, blah, blah. I was in a panic. I found this book just recently that I'm going to read you this. I'm going to read you what I needed to be looking for. And, and it's this 20% red threads. Red threads are activities where you disappear within them and time flies. Think of, these as your, um, think of these as your red threads. Your life at school, home, work is composed of many threads, many different activities, situations, people. Some of these thread, threads are black, white, gray, brown, emotionally meager, a little up, a little down. They don't do much to move the needle. But some are red. Red threads are made of a very different material. They appear to be exactly positively charged. You find yourself instinctively wanting to pull on these threads. And when you do, your life feels easier, more natural. Time rushes by. So I liked my time at KU because I love solving complex problems where like here's all your variables and here's the equation to apply. Actually, engineering wasn't quite like that. And standing in that pump room that day and reviewing those shop drawings, I thought, gosh, this isn't quite what I thought I was signing up for when I got an engineering degree. So what this author, Marcus Buckingham, and I'm gonna, this is one of the giveaways. What Marcus Buckingham says is you don't have to find a job that you have 100% red threads. Your actual goal is only 20. There's research that says as long as there's 20% of the job that you're like, this is great you'll be happy. So I would say in this first job, I was maybe at not much, 5% red threads, where I was like, OK, this part's OK. Um, but I knew I needed to make a change. And so I, I left and came to totally different, right? Like I said, I went to a large firm. I go to Black & Beach. But when I go to Black & Beach, I say, why did they let me? I don't know. I walk and say, OK, I know the things I enjoy. And the only things I found that I enjoy with engineering so far is proposal writing and graphics. So can I have a job? Oh, and by the way, I have two small children. So I just want to work three days a week. And I only really want to do graphics. Is that cool? For whatever reason, they said, sure, and let me come in. I got to do graphics for a few proposals. But mostly, I'm writing really complex proposals for the federal government. And one of my project managers comes down and says, why do you know what you're talking about? I said, oh, well. I actually have an engineering degree. He said, get upstairs. You cannot sit down here and do proposals. We want you to be an engineer. So of course, I am a good firstborn child. So I did what he said. And I went back up to do more engineering for Black & Beach. Uh, I tell you about this because that was an important step to earn my stripes at Black & Beach. Sometimes you're going to take steps and say, mm, OK, I can grin and bear it for a year or a couple of years. But again, I was not really enjoying the design side of the work. And so I was looking around trying to think, what on earth? This is a huge company. I don't understand how it works. I don't understand what my options are. I don't think I like this. I can't do this forever. I can do it for a while. I can be a good soldier. I can do a good job. But I want to find something I really enjoy. And so I literally looked around the office, and there was a lady in the corner who was doing something that wasn't engineering. And so I went and knocked on her door, and I said, hello, what do you do? And she said, I do project controls. And I said, if I buy you lunch, will you tell me more about that? And she said, sure. And so we went and sat down for lunch. And what I literally said to her was, 
when you sit at your computer, what's the first thing you have to do? Please tell me step by step, because that's the piece I forgot when I was in engineering school to say, like, but like, what do you actually do when you get to your job? So I found out Project Controls, essentially, um, what Project Controls does is schedule and budget for projects. So that's getting more into the math side of stuff that I really enjoy and spreadsheets, which just absolutely turn my crank. Um, how did I get into Project Controls? What I did was I went to the chief engineer for the division I was in and I said, hi, um, thank you for giving me a job. I do not want to lose that job. I am not unhappy. However, I would at some point in the future love to explore Project Controls. And he said, cool, yeah. Um, actually, we'd want to see you be an engineer for us for at least two more years before we'd give you that chance. I said, okay. At least I have a plan. I have a plan. I'm feeling good about a plan. I went and sat back down at my desk. Literally two weeks later, I get an email from our chief engineer, and he said, "Hey, somebody just quit in project controls. You guys, are you still interested?" And I said, "Yes, I am." <laughs> um, that's how these things work. I can't promise you that two weeks later the role comes up, but I am telling you, if there's something you're hungry for, put it in the put that bug in the ear of several people, and you'd be surprised when. Stuff comes up and they're like, oh yeah, that's right, Katie was interested in that. So I got to move to Project Controls, starting to definitely get closer to my 20%. Really, um, I enjoyed that a lot. Uh, during this time, I had decided I was not gonna get a PE because I do not wanna be an engineer. Sorry, I shouldn't say that, I love you guys. I love engineering. I'm here to tell you I need you all to be good engineers, but I knew just designing, design engineering where I would stamp drawings was not for me. I had a different path in the engineering industry. Um, however, just candidly, I'm a female in the engineering industry. And so several of my male peers said, I totally hear you about where you want to go with this, but I'm telling you it'll mean a lot behind your name to get that engineering uh, license. Now, I hadn't practiced in, at this point like in five years. I said, oh, oh, I have like small children and da 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 da. A lot of reasons this is going to suck. But I heard them. And so I buckled down and studied and took the PE. Just to, again, like they're, they're, I don't love that. I wish we would say everyone is seen as having equal. Like, come to the table, we're gonna hear all your voices. It helps to have a PE as an underrepresented person in engineering, um, I'll just be honest. So I got my PE, um, they made me an analyst, which means I just did more spreadsheets for them, but I got to be at the table for strategy discussions, which was really interesting. Um, and then they made me a project manager, also really interesting. Uh, I'll tell you a story about that. So uh, becoming a project manager at Black & Beach is a really, really big deal. And I was really grateful for the opportunity to go lead a large classified project that post 9-11 probably doesn't mean much to you guys. I was gonna talk about that later too, but I was like, oh, 9-11 happened when I was here. You guys are probably like, what? Um, Post 9-11, we were trying to work with the government to bring together different agencies so they could better communicate so we'd never have another 9-11. We were building a large classified facility um, that was gonna allow for those um, entities to work closely together and they let me be the design engineering um, uh, project manager. Well, lots of the older, grumpier um, project managers did not think that they should be giving me that chance. So they were telling everyone that except me, but everybody was saying, you know they're all saying that you shouldn't get to do this. So let me tell you how I combated that, just so like a word to the wise on how to combat that. Rather than throwing a fit, being mad, da 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 da, instead, I thought, okay, there must be something they think that they know that I don't know. That's cool. So, um, like once a week, I would come up with what I had in my project plan, my agendas, all the ways that I was trying to make sure this project was successful, and I would take it to them and say, oh my gosh, Mark, you're such a good PM. And I know I'm so new at this, so can you tell me, here's all the things I've done, what have I forgotten? And you know what, hadn't forgotten anything, he had a really hard time coming up with something, it's like, I'll combat you thinking I can't do this by just doing it. And, and being, res like I was respectful, I wasn't trying to be a punk, I'm kind of telling you in a punky way, but I just wanted them to know like, come on guys, we can do this. So that helped um, to really go, to, and I, I went to them in earnestness wanting their input. Okay, so this all took place over the course of like 12 years. So this like, I'm telling you guys really fast, but these things take time. Before I go into how I got above my red threads, what I wanted to show is a couple of projects I got to work on because I act like it was miserable, it was miserable. I was just trying to find my 20%. Um, this is a power plant in Afghanistan. When I was in project controls, I got to be the lead project controls um, analyst on that project. We made sure that there was reliable power in Kabul, Afghanistan. That's something I'm really proud of with, um, that was a heck of a project and uh, had a lot of complexity. I'm really glad I got to be part of it. Um, after Hurricane Katrina, when thousands of people died because the pump stations um, had been designed, there's a whole lot of reasons that the Katrina happened from an engineering perspective. It's actually really fascinating. Um, but one of the many things that they realized was pump stations were manually operated. They were not remote operated when Katrina happened. Well, you can imagine if you are a pump operator and your family might be dying, 
Are you going to stay at that pump so you can turn it on when the time is right? Are you going to go take your family and get the heck out of Dodge? So I got to be on a project where we worked with the Corps of Engineers to make sure that those pumps are going to operate no matter what the next time there's a hurricane. I'm proud of that. I got to work on some really cool projects. Um, and I mentioned the classified work I got to do. So my, I speak a lot of times to high school students, and I always tell them, I can't tell you what I did because that really gets them very excited. And if you ever want to do classified work, it's really important that you make really wise choices when you're young because they look at your entire history. They look at how you spend your money, how you drink alcohol, if you do drugs. Do, 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 do. So classified work's really cool. Um, the only bummer about classified work is you can't tell anybody about it. So you can't go home to like mom and dad and be like, oh, this is a really cool project. And my dad actually has classified clearances as well. So he definitely knew I shouldn't be talking about it. So no talking about classified work, um, which is a bummer. But you do get to work on some really amazing things that you can also be really proud of. OK, so I had this epiphany. I found a rabbit. So what happened was I went to, I'm really not very flexible. I'm like uptight and can't touch my toes. But my good friends at work all were going to yoga over lunch. So I was like, OK, 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 I'll go to yoga. When you go to yoga class, I don't know if you guys have been, but these lovely instructors are so peaceful. And they're like, oh, Abby, good job. That's looking great, Jill. Keep it up. OK, nice work. No one ever says, Katie, good, good. Yeah, that's good. Never, except when it was time for rabbit pose. And I would do rabbit pose, and they would go, class, stop, stop what you're doing. Stop, look, look, Katie, this is perfect. And I was like, huh, that's interesting. Went to a different yoga instructor. Same exact thing happened. And I thought, OK, I found the thing. I'm very good at rabbit pose. It doesn't even hurt. And I extrapolated that to say we all have our rabbit poses in our careers. We have the thing we do that's like, oh, when I do this, this is like so easy. It doesn't even hurt. Now, why am I telling you that? Because here's my rabbit pose at work. I realize Black and Beach doesn't understand how we I'm making this really broad, and it's being recorded. So to my colleagues at Black and Beach, forgive me. A lot of people don't understand how we make money at Black and Beach. I have a feeling this is a problem that's endemic in our industry, because when you put a dollar sign in front of math problems, engineers just seize up. We don't want to talk about it. When I was on the Afghanistan project, there was serious stuff I had to figure out, because it was really important. And so I went to the finance team, and I sat down. I was like, OK, I do not get how we're earning revenue on this project. Please walk me through it. And like, I made myself learn it. Well, then I realized no one else knows this. And I realized it's actually not that complicated. And so I made this very quick video. This is just a graphic out of that video, but it was two minutes. I made a PowerPoint presentation. I went into a closet in my building and recorded myself telling my engineers and my proje other project managers how we make money. And literally still have people with this graphic hung up in their office because that's blowing their mind. I realized like, oh, my rabbit pose is like, I see things. I can make them simple. And I can help people understand them. Uh, then it made me think about when I was at Water's Edge. When I was at Water's Edge, I went to one um, convention where there was a bunch of mayors, and I thought, oh, these guys, they don't understand how you, like, what do you even think about if you want to build a pool? These guys have like 500 things. They're like traffic lights they're buying in that booth, and they're thinking about all sorts of things. And then we're like, oh, and you should also build a pool. And they're thinking, how would, where would I even start? What kind of land would I need? How much is this going to cost me? And so I had built this like very simple little like three ring binder, how you would build a pool. And it, People loved it. And I realized when I reflected on, like, oh, my rabbit poses, like, I like to take complex ideas and make them simple and digestible. Ah, I find a mentor. I say, look, this is the thing I think I'm good at. What could I do? He says, ah, oh, I got the place for you. And I find my red thread. He says, you need to go to HR. You should build trainings. And I said, <laughs> Again, I should not allow this to be recorded. I said, um, well, see, like the thing is that um, like, I make pretty good money as an engineer. I assume like HR makes no money. <laughs> and they're like, it'll be fine, Katie. Actually, we really value HR. And so you can come and still make good money and um, do that job. And also, um, all of my colleagues in engineering said, so you're going to go just like fire people all day? It turns out HR does a lot more than that. So I went uh, to HR to talent development so I can be Toby. And my children are mortified that their mother became Toby. Um, no, in all seriousness, my job is to think about how we grow talent at Black and Beach. So building um, development programs, I mentioned it in my bio. Um, how do we grow PMs? How do I make that dollar bill concept expand out you know, exponentially? How do we make sure that we have leaders that are ready for tomorrow? How do we make sure that um, our brand new graduates come in and are equipped? How do we onboard people in a meaningful way? So now. I love my job. I probably would say I'm at like 70% red threads. I am very happy with where I finally found my way. Why am I happy? Because Marshall Goldsmith's next book, this book, 
is um, really good. I had a chance to meet Marshall Goldsmith. He's a phenomenal executive coach. But he talked about this concept. He just came out with this book. He wrote this during COVID. And he talked about this concept of um, aspiration. And um, I'll kind of walk you through how I think you might want to apply this. Aspiration is who we want to become. It is our pursuit of, of an objective greater than any defined time-bound goal. We aspire to serve others or to be a better parent or to embody more consistently a way of living or treating other people. Um, so aspiration, he says, you can't find until you've been on a journey for a bit. My aspiration is to improve the lives of my colleagues and the people I speak to, um, which thereby improves the outcomes for our clients, taking complex ideas and making them simple. That's what I aspire to when I wake up every day. Um, but what Marshall Goldsmith says is you're not going to find that when you're 18 or 20 or 22 years old. You just can't. He said, we all start with action. So I have a, I have a, a first and second grader. They have an action every day. I tell them, your job is to learn. They just have action. They don't know yet where that's heading. They're going to have to figure that out. You start with action in life. You just start somewhere. Just start. Then you start to get ambition. You guys are probably at that place, right? Like I, uh, My ambition is to graduate from engineering school. My ambition is to go work at Tesla. My ambition is you start to have ambition. Then like as you get into your 30s, you start to figure out like, oh, I have aspiration. This is my bigger thing that I will not accomplish in this lifetime. I will not say I arrived. I cannot say like, there will never be a day when it's like Katie Schultz finally improved the life of every colleague. You can't, right? It's just an aspiration. I'm always moving towards it. So uh, I, I really appreciate the way Marshall laid that out. It's OK for now, for you guys in your life stage, to say like, pick up that next ambition. But as you find that ambition, start to see if it's starting to point you towards what that aspiration is, because that aspiration is where you're really going to find that you get out of bed every day super excited. OK. This is like a model I share a lot at Black & Beach. It seems really simple. I always am nervous to share this with super smart people, because they're going to go, OK, that's too simple. But I have so many people say this resonates, so I hope it works for you. When you're thinking about your career, there's three things you have to think about. First is how you can add value. This is huge in the market that we're in, where the world is changing under our feet daily. Okay, What adds value today won't add value tomorrow. The roles that existed when I started Black & Beach are very different. Okay, What are you skilled at? That's what you guys are working on right now. You're in engineering school to get a skill, right? to be a darn good engineer. And then this is the piece that I just talked about. What are you really passionate about? Here's where you're going to probably come out at sc of school. You're probably going to say, like, I found a thing that I can do where I can make some money, and I'm good at it. The risk is you're bored, right? That's why I come here to talk to you about the other, the other circle. You could say, um, I'm really good at it, and I'm really passionate at it, but it doesn't add value, right? I have sometimes made analogies to what these kinds of jobs could be, but I feel like I'm always hurting someone's parents' feeling in the audience who does that job. But there are jobs out there that don't make a lot of money. If that's something that's important to you, you're going to be poor. That's OK. Some people are. I have friends who are, and they're happy because they're doing the thing. They're here. They are doing the thing they love, and they're really good at it and I'm happy for them. Um, you could say, I really love it, and it could make a ton of money. Like, I want to be Patrick Mahomes, but I could not be Patrick Mahomes because I just don't know how to play football. So that's unlikely, right? So you're, um, you're trying to find that sweet spot in the middle. Most likely, we start out on the board with, with an engineer. Not, engineering is not boring. But it's hard to find just that sweet spot that really fits what you're really interested in. This applies whether you're heading on a managerial track like I did or if you're looking for a technical track, right? It's not, I'm not. I want you to hear me. Uh, you can absolutely use this across the board. Here's the problem. As you get older, your passions shift and how you can add value shifts. So I've watched, uh, sadly, um, markets ebb and flow, right? Nuclear was huge for a while at Black and Beach. Oil and gas has its times where it gets big and then goes down. If there's people who've picked one very unique specialty, that sometimes is amazing and sometimes is a huge risk. Because if we don't need it, it doesn't add value. Now we, we don't need your skills. So the only thing you really have control over is your skill bubble. I would really, really encourage you all to think about continual learning um, so that you can, no matter how your passions shift, no matter how the markets shift, you can always make sure that you're able to add value. So I want to tell you the story. I'm going to save his, I will not use his real name. I will call him Joe. But this is a real person at Black and Beach that um, exhibits this perfectly. So Joe got out, of, he's probably 10 years younger than me, so he's maybe 10 years out of school. And um, he went into our energy business, and he was learning how to build coal-fired power plants. That was his track. Electrical engineer, learning uh, a really good electrical engineer. 
uh, on track to learn how to be a really fantastic coal fire power plant engineer. Um, Black and Beach has declared, and, and, and most of the world is moving towards this race to zero, that we will not be building um, coal fired power plants any longer. So Joe had to figure out what to do. Now he's lucky he's at a huge firm like Black and Beach. We have lots of options of places he could go. So he sees this business called the data center business. Data center business also needs electrical engineers, but they actually need a different kind of electrical. Um, they, my, my electric, I, I led the data center business for a couple of years um, during COVID. And um, not, I didn't lead the whole business. I led the engineering side of the data center business for those from Black Beach watching saying you're not telling the truth. I like to tell the truth. I led the engineering uh, side of our business. Uh, Joe comes over and some of our senior electricals we hired from big, like we hired um, electricals from very boutique, like Water's Edge specialty data center companies that have done this their whole career. Electricals that live, breathe, eat data centers. They tell me, I don't want these electricals coming out of the other parts of the business. They can't do it. Data centers are super unique. Actually, you really need to have gray hair because that's how hard it is. It's really complex, like heart surgery. It's heart surgery on a facility. If this data center goes down, those banks can lose millions of dollars a minute, Katie. We can't be messing around with this electrical stuff. We've got to have really good electricals. OK, um, so stop bringing me electricals from other parts of the business. We've got to hire them from the big companies that are out there that do this all the time. Interesting. So um, that's cool. But tell me about Joe, because Joe actually came from power, and he's finding a lot of success. Yeah, I don't know how Joe did that. That's true. Joe is pretty good. I don't know how he did that. OK. So I go to Joe and I say, Joe, you're doing a really good job. You've only been here a year. You came from power. How did you do that? Everyone's saying it's like a huge hill to climb to learn how to be a good electrical and data centers, but you did it. Oh, yeah, Katie. Um, actually, just like every night and every weekend, I just like read everything I could find. And I got textbooks. And I sat down with the engineers every day and was just asking a ton of questions. Oh, OK. Joe grew that skills bubble fast. Um, I don't want you to think that you have to go to a company and then work every night and weekend to grow your skills, but I do think there is something to be said for somebody like Joe. Joe, like, boom, clicked into data centers within a year and was taking off with that section of his career. Will he pivot that to battery energy storage, or will he pivot that to something else within that space? Most likely because he's exhibited that he has amazing learning agility. So I uh, just really want to emphasize to you the importance of keeping that skill bubble growing. Really quickly, um, I just want to kind of talk through what this looks like, because I do find a lot of our early career professionals are struggling with this. So what happens? Uh, I get a new opportunity, you graduate, you come to a place like Black and Beach, you're going to be stretched and challenged for a while, it's going to kind of hurt. I really don't like starting new roles, even though I've done it many times, but I always think my husband now has watched me do it enough. <laughs> Those first six weeks, I'm just like, okay, this is really hard. <laughs> it's always hard at the beginning, Katie. Remember, it's always hard at the beginning. You're going to be challenged. Then you're going to start to have mastery. You're going to start actually adding new skills. Your bubble's going to start growing. And then eventually you're going to start thinking what's next. This takes time. OK, please remember that. So you may, you may start a new role and say, like, mm, yeah, I'm not actually really being stretched. Please don't be that person. I promise you you're being stretched. I promise you. If you say, I, don't, I really don't think I am, unless you're making copies every day, you are being stretched, I promise. If you don't know that you are, ask, why do you have me in this role? You guys are not going to be cheap resources for Black & Beach. We're not going to put, or any other company, they're not going to put you in some role that's wasting your time. There's a reason they have you in that role, so ask. What is it you think I'm learning? Because I don't know if I'm doing the right, like I maybe don't have the right point of view on this. What did you want me to be learning in this role? There's a, a chief engineer who's since retired, but he told me a story that he had a five year long role that was something to do with administratively in the chief engineer's office. It wasn't filing, but I feel like in my memory it was somewhat filing. I think it was keeping track of specs and, and in a power business that builds coal fired power plants, our specs are you know 800 pages times three volumes. And so he had some role that was somewhat administrative in that space. And he said, I hated that. I was so bored. I thought I was wasting my life. And he goes, everything I learned in that role is what made me a great chief engineer. He didn't realize in those moments that he was being groomed to be a great chief engineer, but he was. Um, so ask if you're feeling like this feels like a waste of my time, ask. Um, I will mention when I was in the business analyst role, basically my job was to sit next door to our president and like help with his PowerPoints and help with his spreadsheets. And I thought, like, where does this go next? This is so weird. Why am I in this role? But I had a mentor and said, like, I'm really confused about why, like, what happens next? And he was like, oh, this is a really amazing role for you because they know you're learning all these skills so you can be ready to be in one of these kinds of roles in the future. Like, oh, that made me show up to meetings differently. It meant I was learning something when I showed up with a different way. Um, the other thing I would say is if, you're, if they say, like, ah, you know what? We're actually waiting on a huge project that's going to come in in three months. This next three months are going to kind of be boring. 
Step up for something new, say yes. Um, that might mean getting involved. At Black and Beach, we have ERDs, employee resource groups. So like I started the Women's Network. Um, that was, that's good for your brand. When you step into something like that, leadership at a different level sees you and sees you as a leader. You can help with corporate challenge. I mean, you can do March of Dimes. You can help with community events. The picture I showed you where we were in Washington, D.C., um, Black and Beach needed to open an office to support a classified client out in Baltimore. And so we had a meeting and they said, who would be willing? <laughs> My husband is a saint. You're going to understand that from this. So they said, who would, um, who would be willing to go to Baltimore and help open an office? And I was like, I would like to do that. That sounds very interesting. I'm kind of bored. So I got home and I was like, so um, I think we're going to move to Baltimore for a year and open an office for Black and Beach. Phenomenal opportunity because when you open an office, top tier leadership's coming out to check on how the office is doing. They're taking you to lunch. They're hearing you talk about how Black and Beach makes money and how this client's interacting with you. That was huge for my career. So say yes, step up to something. Um, like I mentioned, please know this takes time. I've watched early career professionals who step into a role for three months like, okay, I've done this. What's next? No, really, you need to watch a cycle. I would say two to three years is really the time it takes to establish and learn something really well. And then if you are, when you are ready for what's next, make sure you let folks know. Don't leave a company because they weren't giving you that next role. Like, make sure you've got mentors. Make sure you're talking to your supervisor. Um, they can't read your mind either. There are some engineers I worked with who wanted to stay in role for literally, like, I need, <laughs> Joe. Joe, you would be a great PM. Are you interested in that? Katie, maybe. But I want to do this for like 10 more years. Super cool. I love that for you, Joe. But if you're ready to be a PM, please let me know, because I don't want you to quit to go to Burns, because they're going to make you a PM. Like, make sure you're being transparent with your leadership. OK, I want to make sure I leave you guys time for questions. Three things here. I won't belabor it with too many stories. But do be mindful that the old, day, the old way of working was this ladder. We don't have ladders anymore. A lot of people say we've moved to lattices. Actually, those who are really thinking about the world would say it's kind of a scavenger hunt. The roles are changing so quickly in our markets, because our clients' needs are just almost too hard for us to kind of keep up with that. I mean, I'm watching roles get created definitely yearly that we just didn't have the year before. So to plot out a course can be difficult. However, I will show you something around. This is a, this is a way that I recommend to our professionals to think about career. So I, sorry, I didn't update the years, but you get the concept, like a, a longer term plan. What I, what I like about this is um, I would encourage you to lay out other people in your life. Doesn't have to be, you know, I'm not trying to say you have to have a spouse or even have children, but there may be a person you take care of or you know, there's other people in your life, so use that on the bottom half. And then you can plot out some roles you might be interested in. So in this case, you may say, I know in the next couple of years I want to earn my PE. Let's just say for this example, I have a spouse and I know that's really important to that person to finish grad school. And then eventually we want to have a family. Maybe we don't have one now, but we know in the next few years. So lay that out first and understand what, what big rocks matter to you. And then start to plot like, OK, so that means when I, after I get my PE, I can be promoted to a four. But I actually might want to think about doing project controls. And I would encourage you to share this kind of graphic with um, your mentors and managers so they see what you're thinking about. Once grad school's done, then we could take a field assignment. We could do an international field assignment and actually save some bank, because we would get per diem, and there'd be some financial benefit to that. And I, I really want to make sure I get some field experience at some point, because that'll set me up to be a really good PM. But if I don't go PM, I might go BD, business development, because I really do enjoy sales. Like, this is having some flexibility, but being a bit planful. And then you can say, like, so in the meantime, I think I'm going to join an ERG to grow my network. I'm going to take Toastmasters because I don't really like public speaking. And I'm going to hope for some PM development training from Black and Beach or wherever you work. And I'd love to eventually start serving on the board and serving my community. Does that view make sense as a way to think about careers? And you could take this to your mentor. You can, of course, have more than two options. You can have all sorts of options. But the thing I really like is laying out the, the pieces at the bottom that I think we can forget um, when we're young. OK, but remain flexible because life isn't predictable. We think we're going to graduate. We're going to get that great job. We're going to work really hard. We're going to get promoted. And we're going to win. Um, I already mentioned this, but our markets are shifting. There's limited opportunities in certain fields. You might just have a difficult manager who's blocking you. Pol politics in the office, but politics in the world um, can really shift. Where I mean, our markets definitely get impacted by politics. And maybe you're just like, this work isn't interesting, and you've got to start over on a different journey or a different path. I've had, I've had folks who've left Black Beach to go be nurses. Maybe that's what you know, happens. I hope not. Um, but life isn't predictable, so be gentle with yourself. The other thing is family dynamic shift. Um, people die. 
life goals change, there's illness. I've had a couple different colleagues who've gotten cancer and they like pause for 18 months, pause for two years and come back and recalibrate on what that can look like. Um, I had, my daughter, when she was three, had a brain tumor. We were getting ready to move to Ukraine. We were really exploring moving to Ukraine to support a project that Federal had in Ukraine. And then we found out my daughter had a brain tumor. It's like, well, I'm not moving to Ukraine. So um, luckily she's okay now, but life isn't predictable. So, you know, be flexible. Okay, I wanna wrap up by talking about this story and I, my dad isn't able to be here tonight, so that's good because I'm gonna totally tell a story of my dad. Um, when I, when, you guys won't even believe this because you're so young, but when the internet came, which probably seems weird to say, when the internet came to our house, I remember standing at the desk with my dad and he was so excited to show us the internet. And he like dialed it up, you guys should Google it, it's a sound. And up comes this thing, the web crawler, and you could type in some search, I mean it was nothing like today. And we're all like, okay, dad, like, what are we gonna do with it? And dad says, from now on, we can read every bill in Congress. And we were like, awesome, because we are the nerdiest family. Um, but it turns out the internet actually did a lot more for us. So um, I speak at a high school that I went to, I speak every year at that high school. And this is, I've used this slide for many years to say, the internet especially has just absolutely transformed the things that are possible in our industry. And I really think it's interesting because, um, they call my generation the Oregon train generation because there's like this like few years where I had school without computers, but then I was still the computer generation. I was born in 81. Um, I work with a lot of people who had, who did pen and paper. I mean, I, there's still people at Black and Beach who did paper and memos and mimeographs and things like that. The difference in these, like my kids are on, um, the, they're playing games that are like three-dimensional and like I can't do Minecraft. I just, my brain can't do it, but they're just like do, 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 building all these amazing things. Look, mom, I made my name and a huge building and da, da, da. It's so cool. So the thing is, I say all that because you guys' generation is a huge advantage to my generation and to the generations that came before me. The speed with which you're gonna understand these things and help us to figure out how to apply. Like, we're like, um, that 3D printing looks interesting. I wonder what could be done with it. And you all are like, doing it. So I really, really commend you for sticking it through with engineering school. I know it's not easy. Um, but I, I had to add to this slide because um, the longer I've been giving this talk in my high school for the last 15 years, other things are at play actually. Um, the globalization of the workforce, offshoring of um, engineering capabilities means you just need to be nimble on your feet about what is that is gonna make money here in, in um, Kansas City or in the United States. Um, climate change is having huge impacts on our clients. Um, project financing is a deal. Think about what COVID did to um, our supply chains. A lot of our really experienced folks are retiring. We are not backfilling them enough. So that leaves us in a lurch me in talent development, you as you come in and you're like, I need someone who can explain to me why it is we used to do it this way and those folks are retiring. Um, like I mentioned many times, our markets are shifting and overhead pressures are a deal. And then of course, now COVID, your generation lived through COVID. Um, COVID had huge impacts on where we do our work, like I mentioned, supply chains. Um, our clients still had to get things done. Working in the data center space during COVID was terrifying because they cannot shut those data centers down, but to send, especially some of my folks who were more senior in age and they were super high risk, but they're the only ones who know how to make that data center work. Like it was a thing to send someone and say, oh, please don't let anything happen to that person. I would feel terrible. Um, so you all have lived through it. Um, when I was at KU, 9-11 happened, I was in Learned Hall and I was getting ready for structural analysis and my professor walked in and said, it was actually, Dr. Molinazzi walked in and said, my wife just called and said a plane hit the World Trade Center, that's weird, and like goes wandering out, but we're all engineering students, we stay very quiet. And then uh, the professor came in and said another plane hit and that whole day on campus was just dead silent and the world shifted under our feet. But unfortunately, that was just the beginning of the world is shifting. I don't mean to be scary, I just mean to say I need you guys to be amazing engineers because we need you. There's big problems to solve. So make sure I leave time for questions. There's no right answer. Know yourself, find your rabbit poses get to your 20% red threads, make sure you search out that aspiration. You won't know it today, but keep an eye out for it. Um, maybe like when you're 35. Uh, keep your skills fresh, grow that bubble. Find your course, but stay flexible. Be tenacious, we need you. There's one more book I'll tell you that I'm giving away tonight. This is a great one. If everything I just said, you're like, I think I'm gonna need all those things, but I'm not gonna remember that because she talked way too fast. This book is really a really, really good one. It really walks you through a lot of what I said um, about, and it's gonna help you with wayfinding. Wayfinding is the ancient art of figuring out where you're going when you don't actually know your destination. For wayfinding, you need a compass and you need a direction, not a map, just a direction. 
Think of the American explorers Lewis and Clark. They didn't have a map when Jefferson sent them out to travel through the land acquired in the Louisiana Purchase and make their way to the Pacific. While wayfinding to the ocean, they mapped their route. Wayfinding your life is similar. There is no one destination in life. You can't put your goal into GPS and get the turn-by-turn -turn directions for how to get there. What you need to do is pay attention to the clues in front of you and make your best way forward with the tools you have at hand. Um, so this book will help you with that, and I brought a copy of that for you as well. And the last thing I'll just say is I'm rooting for you. Thank you guys for listening to me, and feel free to ask me any questions. Thank you. That was great. All right, there's got to be a lot of questions. <laughs> Who's got a question? I know at the beginning you touched on like the pros and cons of working at a big company and a small company. In your honest opinion, what do you think is the better route for like coming out of college? Mm. That's a good question. It really depends on what your longer, if you understand your longer term goals. Um, my bias is to go to a big company because we need, we need you. And I think you would be marketable out into a smaller firm with that background. So the person that I, that really, um, Cole's dad worked with another guy and he started Black and Beach. They both started at big firms and then started their smaller firm. So that would be my bias because that's what I need. I need you guys to all come work at Black Beach. Um, but um, I do not begrudge the experience I got from the smaller firm either. And we are, the market for engineers, I don't think you all have anything to worry about. So if you said, I'm gonna try it for a couple of years and then pop around, like you will find a job. I can almost guarantee you that we need engineers so badly. Yes? Um, I was wondering what the process looked like for when you switched over to HR to how you got to a vice president position. Was that something that you were offered or was it something you aspired to? Oh, that's a good question. So I did not move to HR as a vice president. I moved into HR um, to lead one program. And so they gave me a bite-sized chunk to see if I even could do this. Because being in corporate and running huge programs that support all 10,000 grumpy professionals is not easy, right? Like, I literally get calls every day. It's like, you know what your program needs to do? And it's like, yes, I can't make everyone happy. I understand that. So they gave me a small piece, um, but they let me present to our leadership team, which is like our CEO and all of his direct reports. And that day... I took a complex idea, I made it simple, I presented it, I like to present it, you can probably tell. And when I walked out of that room, two different presidents came to me and they're like, what are you doing next? You should come work for my business. And I was like, oh, this was a thing. Okay, this was kind of like an audition for what comes next. Well, HR liked my work and I liked HR, so then they added scope for me. Like, okay, could you also run these three programs? And they added a little more scope and then, like, it just takes time. So I became a director, I did a director for a while, I did a good job at that. They made me an AVP, Associate Vice President. Hopefully I did a good job at that because they made me a vice president, so hopefully I'm doing a good job at this. But that, it's a stair-step piece. You start kind of manager, director, AVP, VP, SVP, EVP, and president is how it goes. Yes? How has studying engineering influenced your perspective? Would you do it differently if you could go back? I would not do it differently because I'm grateful for the things that I've learned. I would not, I don't think they would let, I don't think I would be as effective at HR right now um, if I had not done engineering. I think it made my work and where I'm at now possible. So I am grateful. If I could have 10 ch chances at life, which you only get one, I kind of would like to be a teacher too. So that's why I come talk to you guys. I got to like get that teacher itch scratched without having to, to go back and do anything crazy. So kind of on a follow up on that is, you talked about finding a rabbit hole and like yes. you kind of look back through, because you realized that like a long time I had, do you have any advice on how to kind of find your rabbit holes like beforehand instead of you know being at the end of the rope and say, oh damn, I should have done that? Yeah, yeah. So it's interesting. I was cleaning out our basement um, this summer and I found like all this stuff from high school and I was like, oh my gosh, Katie, how did you not see this? Like it was all of my rabbit holes. So look at the projects you did in high school. So for instance, um, in high school, before my senior year, our teacher said, this summer you have an assignment. Um, I want you to come to the first day of your senior year in your fancy AP English class with um, an, like some kind of project you did around a book you read. Well, I spent the entire summer making um, a book called Shakespeare in a Nutshell, and I took all the Shakespeare plays and I like made them one page long, and I put all these cute graphics all around the corner, like so that like you had a book you could like understand all of Shakespeare. That's my rabbit pose, but I, I loved that summer. I still think about that summer. I just stayed up every night till like four in the morning, just like reading it and making it small and da 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 da. -da. Think back to when you were a kid and something that you're like, oh yeah, that was a really good day. I loved that day. Why did I love that day? I also loved that day. Is there a common theme? Like it takes some reflection. You're not gonna be able to sit for an hour, but like do think back to stuff you've done that you're like, oh, I really enjoyed that. What is it about that? And start to look for the common threads. The more you, once you start to get onto it, then you're gonna realize like, oh yeah, that actually happened several times before. Like now that I found it, I 
can see it, but I didn't see it in the moment. Just be watching for it. Yes? Okay, so you did mention like you were trying to move in the scope of the business and then you got, you worked as a project manager. I was wondering if you kind of took like interview courses on the side or did you just get promoted, promoted just based off of like your experience in the company and the platform? That's a good question. So for me, um, I did not take PMI. I didn't, I didn't take additional classes. At Black and Beach, we do offer um, PM courses to help our PMs to get ready. Some people do get PMI. The risk, how do I say this? You will not speed it along by getting a certificate necessarily. So what I have people come to me is say like, well, I'm ready to be a PM. Look, I passed the PMP. Like the PMP is, man, sorry for those people watching that are recording this. The PMP is really a vocabulary test is kind of my opinion. So like, yes, you can pass a PMP, but does that mean you can be a good PM? I'm not so sure about that. So what we would do at Black Meach generally is you'll be a project, you'll be an engineer on a project. If you're doing good at that for a while, we'll make you a discipline lead. So like the lead civil, and you'll have civils underneath you. And again, it's much like I just talked about with my HR role, right? Then you get a little more scope. And then if you're doing good at that, you might become the engineering manager of all the disciplines. If you're good at that, then you might make a great PM. I took a different track because I did project controls. What we really need our PMs to understand is how the project makes money, and because that was the skill set I built up, I kind of skipped over the understanding all the disciplines. I actually don't understand all of our disciplines, which was my handicap as a PM, but being mindful of that, I just knew I need to ask plenty of questions to my discipline leads so that I didn't leave them in the dark. But as long as you, you'll never be able to build every good muscle. You have to just know your weaknesses and shore yourself up with the right people. And when I led our engineers, and data, I led our PMs and data centers first, and then um, my boss said, I want you to also lead engineers. And I said, well, that's actually going to be a problem because I wasn't really an engineer that long, and I haven't been an engineer in a really long time. And he said, it doesn't matter. Th this will work. So when my very first meeting with my team, I said, hey, so I'm sure you're thinking this person probably isn't going to be able to answer a single engineering question, and you, all right, I'm not here to lead you to be great engineers by answering your engineering questions. I know you guys are great engineers. I'm here to get roadblocks out of the way. I'm here to make sure that everything that you need to be successful besides the technical answers, because you guys have those. Bureaucracy of companies makes you really tired and I can help with that. And that I loved working with that engineering team and many of them I still mentor because it was, it was really beneficial, mutually beneficial. They were great technically and I helped them make sure they could business-wise be successful. Yeah. Well, knowing what help you need first, being really mindful of the time of anyone that you're going to ask for help. So be like succinct and clear about what you're asking. Like, here's what I need and here's why I need it. Um, and find the right people. There's going to be people who are not going to be that helpful. They're going to just, um, I call them friendlies. Keep your eye out for who the friendlies are. Um, and also pay it back. So I have asked for a lot of help, but I do mentor a lot of people. Like, um, make sure that you're paying it back, doing it for somebody else. Yeah. Well, again, it depends on what you're, so um, I run an early career program and I interview um, people for it. There are people out there and I adore them. I'm so grateful that they exist and you're probably, some of you are in this room who are like, I want to be the best engineer in this space possible. And when I interview them, they want to talk great detail about like their senior design project that had, and then they start launching into like data and figures and I love that. And I think like their personal brand is going to be pretty heavy engineering and that's beautiful and wonderful and we have a home for them. Um, if you say like, I'm more interested in kind of what else is available at Black and Beach, then I want to hear about the job you had at Walmart where you were managing a hard conversation. I want to know how you give back to your community. Those things are all good no matter your skill set, but if you're really interested in doing beyond engineering, I would kind of model that through um, other things. I, I love when I interview somebody right out of college and uh, uh, behavioral interviewing is when we say, tell me about a time when, and that's how we can draw out to make sure that you're going to kind of do the, like, I assume you're technically competent if you graduate from a good engineering school. So what I need to know is like, how are you going to work on the team? What's your culture fit going to be like? So we'll say, tell me about a time when you had to have a conversation with someone that was uncomfortable. Tell me about a time when you worked with someone you didn't really like. That, those kinds of questions. Um, and I, my favorite is when someone's like, I'm sorry, all my examples are from Walmart. And I'm like, oh, thank you. I love this. It means you worked really hard. You kept with one job. You've had hard, like if you stayed at a job for three years, you probably became some kind of a manager type role and you had to have hard conversations. My daughter right now works at Chick-fil-A and 
she's kind of getting tired of it. I'm like, the good thing, Carolyn, is you've been there for two years now. Like, that's great on a resume that you stayed someplace when you're young for two years. Um, I worked in the dean's office when I was at, I worked with Amy when I was um, here at KU. Like, there's things I learned there that I'm still using. So just kind of think about how you represent your skill set beyond just your classes. Your classes are phenomenal. KU is a great school. But what else did you do? What else did you learn? Yeah. The only opportunity I've turned down, um, especially early in my career, was that Ukraine opportunity. And my daughter did get sick, but serendipitously, like the week before we found out about her brain tumor, I had met with our um, <laughs> the guy who was trying to get me to come. And I said, this was all before the, the war. I said, OK, so but like my worry is, like, what if the country gets invaded? Like, I have four kids. They're going to be across. Like, they'll be in different schools all over. And he goes, oh, we have an evacuation plan. And like, as soon as he said that, I was like, ah, never mind. I don't think I can do this. Um, that was literal physical risk. I didn't go to Afghanistan. I was set to go to Afghanistan. And then they did a debrief with me on the protocol of what happens if you get kidnapped. And I was like, you know what? Actually, I think I have something scheduled that day. I don't think I can go. So physical risk for me has been way bigger. Um, it's unlikely you're going to say yes to something that's going to derail your career, especially when you're young. Um, even if you st sign up for something and you're not super successful at it, take that as growing your skill bubble of things you know I don't like or things I know I'm not good at. And that's OK, too. Um, I think especially before you're 40, you're probably not going to say yes to something that's going to be just tre like tremendously risky. Um, as you get older, you probably could sign up for something that's too big. or like That's when I've seen people kind of go, oh, that didn't work out so well for them. But when you're young saying yes. I will say, here's a risk from a personal brand perspective that just is, um, ticks me off. I said yes to Baltimore. What I didn't say is, how much money will I make? What is going to be my promotion when I get home? I didn't say that mostly because I was naive and didn't know you can say that. I have since learned that's what everybody says. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Take the job. The money will come. I promise you the money will come. After I came home from Baltimore, that office said, hey, we're thinking about having so-and-so come out and take your place. Hey, we're thinking about, I met with like three different people. And every single time I met with them to tell them how great Baltimore was, the great clients you could interact with, the opportunity to grow, the first thing they all said was, so like, how much money did you get? That's a derailer to me. That's risky business to say to a leader, how much money am I going to get? What will be my promotion after this? Don't do that. You will have a promotion after this. Do a good job, and we'll talk about it. Do a good job, and you'll make plenty of money. Don't start there. That's my op opinion. It's different. Some people say, like, you got to say it. I don't agree. But there's different ways to do it. I just wouldn't do it that way. Yeah? Yeah. So my, yeah, my husband stayed home with our kids um, when they were little. And we homeschooled them so that they could go everywhere with me. So we moved to Baltimore. I was able to say, yeah, I'll go to Baltimore because we were homeschooling them. And by we, I mean he. Um, my kids went everywhere with me. My big girls, especially when they were little, they went to all of our project sites, um, any client meeting. Now, that all was on my dime again. Like, it was important to me to be a good mom. It was also important for me to get to do these things. And so when I went to New Orleans for two weeks to help the Corps of Engineers, my girls just went. We could do that because we homeschooled. It was a choice, to be clear. Like, we have been a single income family. That's a choice. Most of my colleagues are dual income. Um, even having children has been a choice. A lot of my colleagues have made the choice not to have children because it does limit the things that you can do. Um, but the sacrifice we chose to make, because I did really very much want to have a family, was that Brandon stayed home. And um, he still he runs his own photography business. He's an architectural photographer with his architecture degree. But he works maybe 10 hours a week. Most of the time, he's doing kid, kid care. That's the kind of choice we made personally so that I could do the things I do. And most executives, especially female executives that you hear talk, their husband took a, a side, like he sidelined himself so that she could be successful, or vice versa. It is very hard with children to have. Not impossible. There are people out there who do it. But it's really hard to have two really successful spouses and kids. Yes? I know that I like this, proposals and graphic design, and I need like a limited schedule of say working three days a week. So I'm wondering like, especially for those in the room who may be negotiating their first job in the next couple of years, like 
what what advice do you have for like advocating for yourself and, and what what items do you bring up in like in a, a negotiation like in their first job would they say like this is what I know I want to do and these are my time constraints or do you save that till you've got four years of experience? My advice would be to save it. So at Black and Beach we don't negotiate first jobs. Everyone gets started at this we actually literally have a chart. Mechanical start here, civil start here. Now we bump it like $1,000 if you were one of our interns. or like So we have a few, the chart is clear. We cannot negotiate that. We don't negotiate starting vacation. But after you get into a door, now you can start to have conversations around what would you need to see from me to feel comfortable letting me work from home more often? Or what would you need to see from me? Or if I was to go to 30 hours a week, what are, what, what are some of the things you'd be worried about if I was to do that? I will tell you, if you want to do 30 hours a week, the chances are you're going to do a 40 hour a week job and only get paid 30. So just be really mindful that that often has been my, my experience in a lot of, sorry, like it's a bummer. And you might have an amazing manager who's really good about being strict about it, but the work tends to bleed into 40 hours and you're like, well, I just, I don't have all the great benefits, but no, I just, yeah. So just, that's a watch out with that methodology. But definitely your first job, at least at Black and Beach, we don't negotiate. But that doesn't mean it's super fair. Everyone starts at the same place. Okay. <laughs> Uh, we've reached the end of our hour. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. Yes. Thank you, Katie, for presenting. It was fabulous. Uh, I'll, yeah, I'll stay. Absolutely.